Good evening. Welcome to Newcastle After Dark. We are your hosts, the management, coming to you from the land of maize donuts and mapines, bringing you films that are a feast for the mind. Tonight's film is 1975's made-for-TV movie, Trilogy of Terror, starring Karen Black. You know, what's great about this movie is it shows what a great actress Karen Black was. She definitely was. Yeah, I'm, you know, she's uh, she's she's really good in this movie. Yes. Um, the stories are interesting. Yes. The writing is great. Richard Matheson. And she really shines in this. She does. Now, you know, prior to this, she had been in some uh, other films, such as Easy Rider. Mm-hmm. She was an Easy Rider. Uh, she was in The Great Gatsby uh, with uh, right. Robert Redford and right. Mia Farrow. Yes. And uh, Day of the Locust with Donald Sutherland. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember Karen Black uh, from films uh, like Airport 1975 yeah. and uh, The Picks from 1973. I didn't see that one. She's good. She's, She's always good. good. Oh, yeah, she is. She is. So sit back, relax, and enjoy 1975's Trilogy of Terror. God, have you ever seen so many dogs in one place? Uh, the trouble with you, Chad, is you're just spoiled. Yeah, I know. Morning. Now that's ugly. I just got the weirdest idea. Yeah, what? I wonder what she looks like under all those clothes. Oh, Eldridge? Are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. It's kind of like the idea just jumped into my head. triangle. Can anyone tell me why Fitzgerald's name is on the bottom? Mr. Foster. Because Fitzgerald's liberated work of the 20s, beginning with This Side of Paradise, formed the base for the extended realism of both Hemingway and Faulkner. Quite correct. I would like to amplify this aspect of the discussion, but I see by the clock that our time is up. Your assignment due for tomorrow's class will be the final chapter of For Whom the Bell Tolls. You are to summarize this chapter with special emphasis on the protagonist's time continuum thought processes relating to his father's death and his own impending death in Spain. Class is dismissed. carry a lot of books. Yes. Miss Aldridge, you go to the movies much? Sometimes, not often. No, I do. A lot. But then I tend to think in pictures. Oh. Yeah, you see, my hobby is photography. Well, that's very interesting. I thought that maybe we it's could... It's very nice talking with you, Chad, but I do have another class. Yeah. See you. You're really serious about that, aren't you? Well, you've got any funny ideas, you better forget it. <laughs> Don't go messing around with teachers. 
Oh, really? Mm. Gee, I didn't know that. Going out tonight? No, I have too much to do. You know, for the kind of money they pay, you put in an awful lot of hours. That's true. Julie, Steve has a friend. He's a very nice guy. But you can't just stay home all the time. You gotta go out sometimes. I'm all right, Anne. Don't worry about me. The problem with you is you don't give yourself half a chance. If you'd work at it just a little, you'd really be attractive. Anne, have a nice time tonight. Okay. Good night. <clears throat> night. Scene in Sanctuary where Faulkner has his character Popeye rape the girl. I prefer Fitzgerald. He only suggests violence. Well, Faulkner was just telling it like it is. I guess some people enjoy violence, lead perverted lives. And speaking of perversion, there's a wonderful old vampire pic playing down at the village drive in this Friday. It's all in French with English subtitles. It's a real classic. How about going to see it with me for reasons of cultural expansion. Well, I thank you, Chad, but you know, teachers aren't allowed to date students. Or, or didn't you know that? So who will find out? My lips are sealed. I won't tell. You have your pick of all these lovely coas, Chad. Why would you want to date me? Because I prefer maturity in a woman. All those others? They're just a bunch of kids. use a drink <laughs> yes I guess I could it's ridiculous but these kind of things always upset me do you want popcorn too oh no I couldn't eat anything but a drink would be fine Chad thank you all right what two large root beers okay. Two large root beers easy on the ice how much is it? Dollar. There you go. Thank you. Thank you.
Here's your drink. <coughs> Thank you. Tastes bitter. Yeah, mine too. I guess they're not putting enough syrup in them. What's the matter? Don't you like the movie, Jazz? Sure, I like the movie. It's just that I like you better. <laughs> What's wrong? I don't know. Do you want to get out and get some air? Can I do something for you? Yeah, I need a room for the night, me and my wife. My name's Harker, Mr. and Mrs. Jonathan Harker. You got any baggage? Yeah, I got baggage. Need $15 in advance. All right. Okay, fill out the card. Thank you. Yeah. late. We're home. <laughs> Boy, you must have really been tired. How could I? Did I really fall asleep? Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, this has never happened to me before. I'm just sorry that I took you to such a boring picture. Well, I... I warned you, at least. I told you I wouldn't be a very exciting date. Forget it. I decided to let you sleep. I figured with all the work you do, you needed the rest. Still, I'm afraid I've spoiled your evening. No. I had a fine time. really sorry. Hey, I thought we agreed to forget about that. Yes, we did. I had a very good time. Thank you. Can I call you tomorrow? I don't think so, Chad. Why not? Because it was foolish of us to go out tonight. I could lose my job and you could be expelled. No board of trustees tells me who to see or who not to see. I do what I want. Now, Chad. No, I really must be firm about this. We can't go out again. We'll see. Good night, Julie.
Chad, it's not even eight o'clock. I want to see you. I told you last night that I don't think we should. Listen, you get dressed, because I'm coming over there right now. You and I are taking a little drive together. Absolutely not. Now, what's the matter with you? I don't find this at all amusing. It's not meant to be. Are you ready to tell me why you're behaving this way? Didn't I tell you? My hobby's photography. You drugged me last night, didn't you? Why could you do something this sick? Well, I think they came out rather well, don't you? Oh, and you can keep these, because you see, I have the negatives. I'll call the police, Chip. No, you won't. First of all, you have no proof that I drugged you. I'll deny it and offer these photos as proof. Tell them you seduced me, that you've got a thing for your students. I'm sure you don't want the police or anyone else to see these. All right, Chad. What do you want from me? The realism of Faulkner. Steinbeck, Hemingway, and even Hammett opened the doors to a new kind of literary expression indigenous to the new American frontier experience. Here was a raw, muscled prose which completely transformed the period and formed a direct bridge Linking us all the way from from the aesthetic realism of a Dreiser to the rather disheveled class is dismissed. Class is dismissed. What are you doing up? Do you know what time it is? Truly. Will you please tell me what's going on? Nothing. I didn't stay up all night to get that kind of an answer. I'm worried about you. It's been like this for a month now. I know, but... Julie, this, this isn't like you. Please tell me what's happening. I really can't talk about it, Anne.
Hey, I want that on. I want it off. Since when does what you want count? Since now. Tonight. This second. It's all over, Chad. It's over. Nothing is over until I say it is. I don't think so. You see, I'm bored. And when I'm bored, the game is over. <laughs> bored? Mm-hmm. Not terrified, not shocked. Just plain bored. Whose idea did you think this whole thing was? What are you talking about? What I am talking about, Chad, is that you are a singularly unimaginative young man. <laughs> Did you really think that that dull little mind of yours could possibly have conceived any of the rather dramatic experiences we've shared? Do you remember the day you watched me walk off the steps? Since that moment, your mind has not been your own. Why do you think you suddenly had the overwhelming desire to see what I looked like? under all those clothes. Don't feel bad. I always get bored after a while. Although, there was one boy in Denver who did keep me amused for almost nine weeks. But then he was wonderfully creative. First you'll experience dizziness, then mild paralysis, and then total cardiac arrest. You've drugged me! No, dear. I've killed you. chemicals, Chad. How dangerous they could be. He was one of your best students, wasn't he? Yes, he was wonderfully bright and spirited boy. You know, I warned him about those chemicals, how dangerous they could be. Are you sure you're okay? Julie, I can skip work and stay here with you. No, you go on. I'll be fine. Are you sure? Yes, sir.
Miss uh, Eldridge? Yes. I'm Arthur Moore. I, I saw your notice on the board. And you need help. Yeah. I, uh, my lick grades are lousy. Do you have time for me, Miss Eldridge? Of course I do, Arthur. In fact, if you like, we can start right now. Oh, that'd be great. I like that a lot. Good. I think we're going to be friends, Arthur. Very good friends. Welcome back. Well, you know, after that story, I would have to say that, you know, if it was me, I probably wouldn't have made it. <laughs> Karen Black looked good in this. She looks real good in this. Really? Yeah. Um, you know what I love about the story is, especially in the beginning, um, you really believe that she's the victim in here. Yes. Yeah, she's this timid, mousy school teacher, doesn't go out, and this horrible, rapey <laughs> uh, high school student yeah. completely dominates her life. Yeah. Uh, you know, especially the scene where he hands her the book and uh, has the note in there, and it says, uh, I have some friends I want you to meet. I know, I know my imagination, you know, certainly oh, runs wild. Mine too. And you know, that's the beauty of these films, where they don't have to show you the ugliness. They only suggest it. And you know, I know that I was thinking some bad things. <laughs> oh, bad. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, my imagination was running wild. And you know, the interesting fact of this is, the guy who played Chad, Robert Burton, was at the time her husband in real life. That's right. That's right. And you know, my man had some good taste in shirts. He did, that shirt with the uh, little X's on oh, it. I'd sport that all day long. I'd wear that shirt. Heck yeah. Yeah, I'd wear that. Um, so, you know, he's another clipping in her scrapbook. Yeah. And uh, the knock on the door, she's off to the next one. Another sucker in line. Yeah. You know, another little interesting piece is that um, when he takes her to the motel uh, to take the pictures, he checks in under the name of Jonathan Harker. From Dracula. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So let's get back to the next story in the Trilogy of Terror. The funeral is over, and I am alone in the house. Therese is out cavorting with one of her men. On this night when father is barely cold in his casket. I ran some old family films to remind myself of when it began. Even then, at 12, she was already using her wiles on him. Poor mother, so weak, so innocent. Never suspecting the depth of evil in Therese. My spoiled sister. Her sweet little face never fooled me for an instant. I knew the darkness behind it. I knew the fermenting ugliness in her soul. Mr. Anmar? Please come in. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. You're wondering how sisters can look so unlike. I have never found it necessary to affect the ways of Therese. Please sit down. Is she here? Oh, no. She's gone to a party. A party? This afternoon at the funeral, she seems so distraught. My sister is an unusual girl, Mr. Anmar. I doubt that you truly understand her. Which is why I've called you here. What do you mean? I want you to look at something. 
Here's Therese and father. She was 15 then. I want you to notice the way she's pressing herself against him. I, I don't understand. Uh, why are you telling me this? My sister is evil, Mr. Anmar. I think you should know that. Even as a child, she was vicious and cunning. But father worshipped her, and she him. When she was 16, she seduced him. Now look, I don't know what you're trying to do, but I don't want to hear any more of this. It was not long after that, that mother died. The doctor said it was an accident. That she had taken an overdose of sleeping pills. But it was no accident, Mr. Anmar. It was Therese. She had put those extra pills in her milk. If this is true, how could you live in the same house while they... Well, you see, I had no place else to go. I had no money and no way to earn any... No escape. So... I kept to myself as much as possible. Try to avoid Therese. To ignore what was happening in this house. You don't believe me, do you? Miss Lorimer, I don't know what to say. These books show what she is. Demonology, pornography, Satanism, voodoo, witchcraft. These books aren't just relics, Mr. Anmar. She uses them to capture the souls of others. By her own admission, Satan guides her. You don't really expect me to believe this, do you? But you must believe me, Mr. Anmar. You see, Therese's soul is damned. And I cannot help her. But I can help you. Miss Lorimer, I'm afraid you're the one that really needs help. <laughs> How naive you are! Do you really think she cares for you? She lies to you! She laughs at you! Sorry, but I really must be going now. I know all about that night at Morley and what happened there. She told you about that? Yes. She told me everything. Gloated. Bragged about how she was able to corrupt you. My sister enjoys inflicting pain, Mr. Anmar. And apparently she somehow persuaded you to share that perversion. Now do you believe me? You are saved, Mr. Anmar. I have freed you from evil. This afternoon, while I was out shopping, Therese violated my room in an insane act of revenge. And upon my return, raged at me, using foul and obscene language, cursing me for having dared to reveal the truth to Mr. Anmar. Her behavior was truly bestial. She's becoming more violent by the day. It's as if Father's death has released the demons within her. And I actually fear for my life. Hello? Dr. Ramsey, it's Millie. It's about 
Dr. Rees. She's much worse. Now, I thought we'd settle that matter. You were going to see about Therese. But you can't imagine the things she's been saying about me. About us. Us? She's jealous of our relationship. She twists it into something lewd and something sordid. Look, Millie, I have a hospital call to make in your area tomorrow. I'll drop by and we'll talk about this. Thank you, Doctor. I suppose you're here on your usual mission. I know all about what dear little Millicent told you on the phone. I was listening on the extension in my room, you see. I see. So, I guess it's just a wasted visit, Doctor. Because I know Millicent won't talk about me when I'm in the house. And here I am. Did you destroy her room? Yes, I destroyed her room. Why shouldn't I? She deserved it. I mean, where does that little twit get off thinking she's got the right to stick her nose into my affairs? Don't worry, Doc. I'm sure she's got it all straightened up by now in her proper little housekeeper's manner. Therese, this hatred has got to stop. You'll destroy yourself. Oh, I don't think so, Doc. Besides, it's really all Millicent has. Her hatred of me is the only passion in her lonely, pathetic little existence. You know, you're really a very handsome man, Doctor. If you just loosen up a little. Oh, did that bother you? Do I make you nervous, Doctor? I don't think we need to carry this any further. What's the matter, Doc? You still a virgin? Or, uh, is it that you just don't like girls? I'll call again soon. We don't need you anymore, Ramsey. Why don't you just get the hell out of our lives? Don't phone us and don't call on us. would I allow her to enter? I remained locked in my room, silent, while she raged and swore at me. Finally, she staggered back into her own room and fell into a drunken sleep. 
how I loathe her. I can no longer bear to live in this house and watch evil prevail. Something must be done. Yes. Therese must die. Why? Why did she do it? I was just playing with my dolly when all of a sudden your sister came running out of the house and yelled at me. She said I was making too much noise. Then she grabbed my dolly and threw it on the ground and broke its head. I hate her, Miss Milton. I hate her. You poor thing. Next time I'm in town, I'm going to buy you a brand new dolly. You will? Will it make you feel better? Thank you, Miss Millicent. When I returned to the house, I was still thinking of Tracy's broken doll. And it was then that the solution suddenly became quite clear. At last, I had found the ideal way. How ironic I would use Teresa's own books to destroy her. I began to collect the necessary items. Pairings from Teresa's long, painted nails. Strands from her lovely blonde hair. The rhinestone buttons from her most lewdly seductive dress. And then at last, I had all that was required. Teresa's life held literally within my hands. Hello, Dr. Ramsey. It's Millie. I've been trying to reach you since yesterday. Millie, I'm terribly worried. We must talk. I appreciate your concern, Doctor, but I no longer feel there is any need to talk. You see, things are different now. I've found a way to deal with Therese. I insist that we talk. That is all I have to say to you, Dr. Ramsey. Your advice is no longer required. Goodbye.
This is Dr. Chester Ramsey, 470 Staten Place. I want to report a death. Female, age 26. Cause of death. Cause of death unknown. Just a moment before you take her away. I was the family physician and knew her quite well. Her name was Therese Millicent Lorimore. Most advanced case of dual personality I have ever seen. Well, you know, about a lot of uh, fanfare, I would say that that one was a little bit more predictable. I agree. But, you know, it was made for TV, so, you know, it was still good. It just wasn't as good as the first one, in my right. opinion. I mean, by the time you get uh, to the middle of it, uh, you can kind of predict that it's a split personality. Yes, yes. Yeah. Now, the doctor, uh, where have I seen him before? He looked very familiar. George, George Gaines. Yeah, George Gaines. He was in, he played the father in Punky Brewster. Oh, Punky. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was also in Police Academy. That's right. Well, That's was right. it uh, Commander Lassard? That's right, right. <laughs> yeah. In a more serious role here. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's, I think, what threw me. Right. Now, what did you think about Karen Black and the blonde wig? I think that was the giveaway for the story for me, is that it wasn't believable as her twin sister. I thought that was, you know, Millicent in a wig. Right. I did. I agree. And I still think she looked better in the first story, because that blonde wig wasn't, uh, you know, complimented. For sure. Yeah. So. I agree. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, you know, this one's a little more predictable. I mean, I mean, still a good story, but you kind of guess it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not bad. I mean, it's 1975. It's TV. Right. Now, coming up, our next story mm -hmm. is infamous. Probably the most famous. Yes. Of all the stories yes. from this movie. And I think that anybody that got to see it on TV as a child, it probably scarred them. You're going to enjoy it if you haven't seen it. So let's get back to the third and final story in the trilogy of terror. He who kills. Boy, are you ugly. That face. Even your mother wouldn't love you.
He's gonna love it. Well, better get it over with. Hi, Mom. I couldn't call earlier. I just got home. Mother. Mother, it's about tonight. I know we always spend Friday night together, but I thought... No, I feel all right. It's not that. Mother, I'm not sick. Mother, there's a man. His name is Arthur Breslow. He's a teacher at City College. It's his birthday. And, um... Well, I sort of promised him that oh, we'd spend the night, uh, the evening together. Mother, it has nothing to do with preferring... When do I break my word to you? What do you mean, when? You give me a when, and when do I break my promises? Well, of course I love you. Yes, I do. Yes, I do, dear. <sighs> Mother. Mother, I'm not being cruel. It's just, it's his birthday, that's all. I see you two or three nights a week. Mother, please stop treating me like a child. I'm grown up. I'm not yelling. Because I like it here. It's only a sublease. They'll be, go they'll be back in six months. I like having it uh, uh, for my own. I, I like... I like being alone. I didn't mean it that way. I'm sorry. About a month. I... I meant to tell you before. Um... He's a very nice man. He's kind and gentle. You'd like him. It didn't happen that way. I, I met him after I rented the apartment. Mother, you should see what I'm getting for his birthday. It's a, a genuine Zuni fetish doll. I found it in a curio shop on 3rd Avenue. Arthur teaches anthropology. That's why I got it for him. It's a Zuni hunting fetish. It's really interesting. There's supposed to be some Zuni hunter's spirit inside of it. And um, there's a golden chain wrapped around it to keep the spirit from making the doll come to life. Come to life. It says, should the chain be removed, spirit and doll will become one living. Well, that's what it says. On um, the scroll, the scroll, it, it, it comes with a doll inside the box. You should see his face, Mom. Mom? Why is it always like this? I will not get a headache. I will not get a headache. I am going to take a bath. And then I'm going to meet my fellow. And we're going to have a lovely time. Lovely time. Mom?
Hello, Arthur. Hi. Well, I... Uh, you know me too well, don't you? It is our one night on the town. You know, every Friday night, well... You know, I, I've told you before. I just don't want to hurt her feelings. My moving out was hard enough on her. She... Well, I know I had every right to move out. That's not the point. Yeah, I realize we we planned to spend the evening together, but... Arthur... It's only one day. Couldn't we celebrate your birthday tomorrow night? I just don't want to hurt her feelings. She is my mother, after all. All right. Bye. Hooray for Friday night. What'd you do? Fall off the table? <laughs> Where'd you go? <laughs> Lord, where are you? I guess I found you. At least the tip of your spear. But how you got that far back? We're getting warm. Come out, come out, wherever you are. Is that you, little man? <laughs> He's gotta be there. What's going on?
Dolls do not move about. <laughs> that ball probably just burnt out. Oh, my God. 
This is Amelia, Mom. I'm sorry I acted the way I did. I think we should spend the evening together just the way we planned. It's kind of late, though. Why don't you come by my place and we'll go from here? No, I'm all right. Good. I'll be waiting for you.
Well, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I would have taken that little doll out. Right. I don't think you would have. Right. I would have kicked it. I'd have shot it with a pistol. I would have threw it out the window. I'd have burned it with a torch. Right. It ain't happening. No. You can't I, win. You know, it's, it, it has the spirit of the warrior in it. You can't burn that spirit out. He who kills. You're done. You're done. That's right. Yep. But you know, there's a lot to be said for this one, this story, not just for the scary aspect of it, but the power of Karen Black's delivery. You know, she is, there's only one actress, actor in this. It's her whole story, yeah. It's just, it's just Karen Black. Yeah. And you know, outside of everything else, my favorite part of this is the um, telephone conversation that she's oh. having with her mother. It's so believable. I remember asking you, do um, you think there was somebody else on the other end of the phone? I don't think there was. I mean, she does such a great delivery on that. Yes, I, she does. She does. A, I mean, it's very, it's very moving, and, and extremely believable. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And again, you know, it just, it just showcases what a great actress Karen Black was. She was. Yeah. Now you know, if you had caught that at a young age which I, I think that that would be as frightening as Gargoyles was. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, uh, the scene I remember the most is when the Zuni doll, when she traps it mm. in the uh, suitcase, right. and it's cutting up through that. I mean, that's that's really the part that I remember the most. He was unstoppable. And how scary that was oh. to me. And, you know, they lifted that for the movie Child's Play. You can see, yeah, you know, you can see that there's a lot of inspiration there of what they would use in that movie. Inspiration is probably the more positive term, <laughs> yes. Yes. Right? Yes. So, um, and of course, you know, um, the scene at the end. Yeah, where she's uh, making the phone call to her mother. Mm hmm And she turns around and smiles with those teeth. She's She has that knife. That was scary. Just w it's very scary. It's very scary. Uh, you know, I mean, this may have been a made-for-TV movie. You know, you know, like we said, the ABC, you know, uh, movie. Yeah. Right? But that last story scary. is scary. It's very scary to have just been played, you know, yeah. on television. They saved the best for last in that trilogy. Yeah. Now, you know, it's uh, one of those things where, you know, once again, there was no real carnage, no gore, 
No. It wasn't needed. No, you know, a little bit of blood. Yeah. But really, not not all that gory. But the fear was palpable. You could feel her fear. Yeah. Therefore, you, you were afraid. Right. And that movie would scare me for other movies to come, like Magic with Anthony Hopkins. Yeah, right? yeah. Right? Uh, as the uh, ventriloquist. Well, I mean, you know. It's like you said, inanimate objects that come to life. That's pretty frightening. That's always, especially as a young kid. Yeah. It is. So, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed it. Oh, I, I think it's it. a great film. Yeah. It's fun, but yet, it's scary. Well, we hope you enjoyed it as well. And we thank you for being here with us at Newcastle After Dark. And we hope that you join us again for the Lost Treasure in Cinema. And until next time, good, good night. night. Thank you.